inclusion is impossible. It's a bold statement. It's a tough pill to swallow, but it needs to be said. And here's why no matter how much inclusive effort Singapore plans, proposes and executes, Singapore can still never truly be inclusive. There is one big dilemma that I want to plumb into your heads. Thus, equality equals inclusivity. Keep that at the back of your mind as you continue with this video. Currently, most of the inclusive efforts the general public is aware of is in the infrastructure. For example, the braille in the lifts, the tiling on the floors for the blind, sign interpreters at National Day Parade or Parliament speeches for the deaf. MRT stations with visual cues such as the footsteps to lead you to the LRT, ramps and lifts at most staircases or overhead bridges, which were mostly put in place for the aging population, but it benefits more than just the aging population. It also benefits people with motor disabilities, people with heavy luggages, or people who are tired from working. See, inclusion benefits everyone. Inclusion benefits everybody. In terms of education, the Enabling Master Plan reveals that we currently have 22 special education schools and will be opening 7 more in the new plan in 2030. Societal-wise, arguably, I think the time you see the most support, acceptance and noise about disabilities will be when it's time for Purple Parade. Then it's back to our silly little lives. And the day-to-day -day views are a lot less worth celebrating. The National Council of Social Services in 2019 surveyed across 2,000 Singaporeans and it revealed that only 6 in 10 claim that they accept to coexist with people with disabilities and there's still a 1.8% that have negative attitudes towards people with disabilities. And until this 1.8% turns to 0%, we cannot be truly inclusive as a nation. In the memoir, A Place for Us, written by a blind woman in Singapore about living in Singapore as a blind person, Cassandra Chiu shares a recount on her experience with a guide dog in Singapore. She plants the question, even though it's legal to have a guide dog be on the MRT, would you accept it? Our society lacks the awareness and the conversations about disabilities and disorders. Currently, there's this controversial craze to put the person before the disability. For example, saying boy with autism instead of autistic boy. In A Place for Us, Cassandra Chu writes, A blind man or man who is blind makes no difference to me if the word blind is not used derogatorily until we can put the person first in day-to-day -day realities like education and employment it really makes little difference how disability is labeled saying blue cat is way easier than saying cat that is blue and there are bigger things to be fighting about anyway because of this lack of awareness and conversations in the general public, it keeps Singapore stagnant when trying to shift from a medical model to a societal model for viewing disability. The medical model for viewing disability is defined as a model by which illness or disability is a result of a physical condition, is intrinsic to the individual, may reduce the individual's quality of life, and causes clear disadvantages to the individual. In other words, the medical model views the diagnosis as the person's problem, and the person is the one who needs to change, and the person needs to be the one to be getting treatment and getting better. It's not uncommon for parents to go through a frantic panic and fear after they suspect that their child might have special needs, and to even find all means to cure their child's disability. In A Place for Us, I quote, Some of my blind and vision impaired friends recall similar experiences in their childhood, and others were even brought to spiritual masters who would perform weird rituals on them or encourage the ingestion of strange concoctions to cleanse them of their blindness. Sound familiar? This is quite similar to concentration camps or spiritual cleansings in order to pray the gay away. In the reason I jump, it offers a fresh perspective on how we typically developing people view them as abnormal or something that needs to be changed. This 13-year-old boy with autism lightheartedly states, to us, having autism is normal. So we can't know for sure what your normal is. Sometimes I actually pity you for not being able to see the beauty of the world in the same way we do.
How many of you are guilty of saying or even having the thought, oh wow, they are so good at this even though they can't see or can't hear or something along the lines of needing to mention their medical diagnosis? These backhanded compliments are also a result of having cultivated a medical model for viewing disability in society. And this is no revolutionary observation. Stereotypes have been deeply rooted in our society for basically everyone who is alive and dead. Wow, you're so strong for a girl. You're so good at sewing for a boy. You're so independent even though you have ASD. You're just an assistant. You can't take on this project well. In the book Mindset, Carol Dweck cited a study by Claude Steele and Joshua Aronson titled Stereotype Threat and the Intellectual Test Performance of African Americans. It claims that even checking a box to indicate your race or sex can trigger the stereotype in your mind and lower your test score. Just put more males in a room with a female before a math test and down goes the female score. When stereotypes are evoked, they fill people's minds with secret worries about confirming the stereotype. And having this medical model view on disability that people with disabilities skills and abilities are limited by their diagnosis is undeniably harmful. The more society has the stereotype that persons with disabilities are unteachable, the less they are going to learn. The societal model of viewing disability can be defined as seeking to change society in order to accommodate people living with impairment. It does not seek to change people with impairment to accommodate to society. It supports the view that people with disability have a right to be fully participating citizens on an equal basis with others. In other words, instead of the person changing because of their diagnosis, the societal model views it as a societal effort that society needs to change. This would be the first big reason why I think inclusion is impossible to achieve. How can every individual of society unite in having this one mindset if it discriminates and disagrees over other topics that are very hard to disagree on, such as whether or not a case is considered rape or abuse? I do think there is a certain level of basic awareness regarding physical and sensory disabilities such as the blind, deaf, cerebral palsy, but what about the invisible disabilities such as autism spectrum disorder, intellectual disability, and even lesser known ones that even I have yet to learn about? There are just too many. And realistically, Considering the busy lives of working Singaporeans, unless you are actively learning about disabilities, meaning you work in a relevant field, are studying about special needs specifically, or know someone who has special needs, it's very hard to be consistently updated or know substantial depth about disabilities. I believe that knowledge can be empowering for anyone. So I go to the library, borrow books, and then I would read up on how to help a student with autism, a student with ADHD, uh, and then or, or a person with OCD. Because my eldest son, uh, he had uh, he has relapsed twice for his OCD. Yeah, and he was recently diagnosed with uh, depression. Uh, so he's taking a break from school for about nine months. So it's more for his mental health lah, that he's taking a break from school. Um, so we are supporting him with that. Lah. In the same study done by NCSS, it states that more than half of the 2,000 survey takers have had absolutely no contact with a person with disability in the past year. And even for people who wish to learn about disabilities in depth, the introduction in The Reason I Jump makes the observation that the more academic texts are denser, more cross-referenced and rich in pedagogy and abbreviations, which I can definitely vouch for if you look in my references. And that's another reason why inclusion is so hard, because inclusion relies on having each and every individual know everything. On a side note, if you want an easy read about ASD, The Reason I Jump is a good book to start with because it's written in an FAQ format and also written by a 13-year-old, so it's definitely more accessible than academic papers. Having a brother with ASD, I felt that in the beginning, the family was scared to bring him out into public because they would judge or wonder what's wrong with him. And working in an early intervention service, I've met parents who are in denial about their child's diagnosis or hope that their child won't have to go to a special education school because then people will know that their child has special needs, even though the lessons will be more catered towards their needs than mainstream schools. And honestly, can you blame them for having these thoughts? 
family members of people with disabilities usually hold them up to the belief that they won't be able to survive by themselves when they're adults, and hence either pity them or find more opportunities for them in life. This can be seen in Extraordinary Attorney Wu when Minho's friend thinks that he's doing charity when he goes out with Wu Yang Wu. <laughs> Research reporter in these two papers from 2021 share similar findings that mental health professionals in Singapore do believe that adults with intellectual disability should be provided with more independence in their care plan discussions. However, both also share that many are presumed to lack the capacity to make decisions and hence are not involved even though it is their own care plan. Decisions are made by their family members instead, which might not always reflect on what they themselves want. Should persons with disabilities be treated or viewed this way? Now, hold on to that thought. 그럼 제가 대표님 백으로 들어온 낙하산이 맞는 겁니까? 저 부정 취업을 한 겁니까? 부정 취업이든 뭐든 아빠는 선영이한테 고마워. 아빠도 영우도 그동안 취직 안 돼서 많이 힘들었었잖아. 영우도 부모 대부분 할 거야. 자식의 좌절을 보는 게 얼마나 고통스러운지. In A Place For Us, Cassandra Chu shares a similar recount, and she says, I found out that it was mum who actually paid me, and it was her who pleaded around to create an opportunity for me. Do you think, even if their intentions are genuine, that this is how persons with disabilities should be treated? It gets a little tricky now, doesn't it? And now we circle back to the big dilemma for this video. Does equality equals inclusivity? Everybody's saying we need to treat persons with disabilities as equals, but what does that mean? They are not innately equal, but they also shouldn't be treated with bias towards them just because of their diagnosis. And until every single individual in society is able to agree on one side, true inclusion is tricky to achieve. I don't want to feed my opinion to you, so please leave your thoughts in the comments below. But I want to talk more about the Singapore education system. The Singapore education system is catered to typically developing children, and even so, not everyone is able to keep up with the express streams curriculum. Math is English with its convoluted sentence structures. Science is a matter of spelling technical terms correctly and remembering the model answer in a specific order. In The Reason I Jump, Naoki Higashida reveals, I want to grow up learning a million things. There must be countless other people with autism who have the same desire, the same attitude. But our problem is, we aren't capable of studying all by ourselves. To be able to study like other people, we need more time and different strategies and approaches. The thing about persons with disability is that they can work, they can contribute to society, provided we give them the environment by providing them the necessary support. We accommodate, but they also learn to accommodate, so we work together. You know, there are some things that we explain to them because they can't understand, they just need more explanation. Every parent wants the best for their child, but it's common to feel like they are underachieving because Singapore is so fast-paced and academic-based. I just know I have to appease her that hey, things are huh? going to be fine. We just do whatever is the best. If you ask me personally as a father, I don't set expectation to my uh, to my mm, kids. Uh. We don't know. Academically especially, right? we just let them to love uh, education. How can every child be born equal when the system itself is not catered towards every single child? Every single child is not given equal opportunities to learn the way that they are supported. I speak more about this in my What Went Wrong With Singapore's Education System video. The bottom line is, with all these special education schools in operations and more incoming, while it's good that they have the support that they need in terms of education, society is indirectly teaching both special needs kids and typically developing kids that special needs kids do not belong in the same environment as typically developing kids. And when their rightful opportunities to interact with typically developing people are revoked right when they are born and vice versa, how can Singapore be expected to learn? The truth is, from the moment you have a person with disability in your family, you are no longer treated equal. 
you will need to spend more time and effort learning about the options for education, healthcare, how to integrate into society, and getting over the prolonged looks when out in public. You will have to coordinate therapy and checkups and schools. The 24 hours in a day will look very different from others. And the question is, why does it need to be this way? In this article from Psych, titled A Few Simple Steps Could Empower the World's Largest Minority, the author shares, we can also keep the social model in mind. When you see a person with a disability, don't focus on their condition. Instead, think about how the environment and assumptions make the world less accessible. To end off, I would like to quote from A Place For Us because I believe that it needs to be heard. Inclusivity has been the buzzword for the longest time, but including the disabled does not only mean reserving a seat on the table for us. If you do not interact with us, but spoon food into our mouths and tell us when to chew, you miss the entire point of a shared meal together. At the end of the day, we need to ask ourselves if we are serious about equality and inclusivity, and if we are truly prepared to value each individual. I think we still have a long way to go to valuing every individual without prejudice, and I fear that we might never get there. Leave a comment. I'd love to hear what you think. Okay, bye.